Kevin. And thank you for coming. My name is James, and I'm the Human Educator for the Animal Rights Foundation of Florida. Now, I'm typically giving this presentation to a high school classroom, so my audience is a little different. And um, same, I, same level. Same level. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Um, so I pretty much know my audience. Now, I can pretty much guarantee that 99% of the kids in the class are eating meat, dairy, and eggs. And there might be one or two kids who are vegetarian, but it's a very rare occasion where you'll get a kid who is vegan. Um, when I speak to adults, it's, it's a little different. You know, I don't quite know my audience as well. So I want to get to know you. So here's what I want everybody to do. I want everybody to please stand up. All right, now, if you are vegan, meaning you choose not to eat any meat of the animal, no flesh of the animal, no cows, no chickens, no pigs, no turkey, and no fish, all right, surprise, surprise, a fish is not a vegetable, um, no dairy, no cow's milk, no cow cheese, no cow butter, no cow ice cream, and no eggs, please have a seat. So if you are vegan, please have a seat. Okay. Now, for the rest of you, you'll have to remain standing for the rest of the presentation. <laughs> All right, now everybody, everybody have a seat. Um, there's another benefit of talking to high school kids, and that's they're not afraid to participate in the presentation. They'll say whatever is on their mind, um, whether I like it or not. Um, but with adults, it's a little bit harder. It's like pulling teeth. Now, this presentation is designed to be interactive. Meaning I want you to actually participate. I want you to engage. I mean, think about the presentation. It's like a, a Roshark test. Right? I show you a picture, and you tell me what you see. All right. So the maturity level is the same as high school students. It's a mushroom, people. All right. How many of you have ever seen the movie The Matrix? All right, so. Maybe more than half of us. For those who haven't seen the movie The Matrix, there's a scene in the very beginning of the film where the main character is presented with two pills, one blue and one red. And he has to make a choice. If he chooses the blue pill, he'll fall asleep. And when he wakes up, everything will be exactly the way it's always been. If he chooses the red pill, he'll finally learn the truth. And I'm here today to give you that red pill. But let me make this very clear to you. I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm not here to tell you how to think, how to feel, and I'm certainly not here to tell you what to eat. I'm simply here to provide you with information. Now, what you do with that information is solely up to you. So, what does the matrix look like? Let me show you. Now, despite what you might be thinking, these two circles are not equal. I repeat, these two circles are not equal. One is, in fact, larger than the other. What I need you to do is determine which one that is. So, please raise your hand if you believe the blue circle is larger than the red. All right. Please raise your hand if you believe the red circle is larger than the blue. All right, very good. Now, before I said anything about these two circles, what was your first instinct? Equal, right? because they look equal. And the reason why they look equal is because, in fact, they are equal. These two circles are identical. <laughs> Yet I got just about every one of you to raise your hand and say that they're not. So what do we learn? That you can be manipulated like that to believe in something that goes against your natural instinct. Just, just imagine, just imagine as a child you're taught that the blue circle is larger than the red. If you say it enough times, you convince yourself that's the truth. If you're told the lie enough times, it becomes part of your reality. And if enough people are taught that lie, that the blue circle is larger than the red, well, now it becomes part of the culture. And if that culture then passes that misinformation along to the next generation, well, now it becomes tradition. And what we have to remember is that just because we have a tradition doesn't mean it's morally acceptable. Tradition and morality are not always the same. I mean, can you think of any traditions that we once had in the United States of America that we no longer have? That today we think back and that was immoral. Slavery, right? Less than 200 years ago. And that was a tradition. So the traditions we have today doesn't necessarily mean they're morally acceptable. And as we evolve as a culture, so do our traditions. Now, the matrix is a story. It's a story. When told enough times to enough people, it becomes part of that culture. It becomes the tradition. And this story is being told over and over every day. In fact, if you believe the image on the carton is where you're getting your milk from, you're deceiving yourself. This is a fantasy. It only exists in your head. It's a blue pill fed to you by the industry to get you to buy their product. This is the matrix. 
the lie we tell ourselves about where our food is coming from. The reality is far more disturbing. 90 to 95% of the milk, the meat, and the eggs that we consume in the United States are coming from these conditions. Now, this is called factory farming. This is where you take thousands of hens, pigs, and cows, you can find them into warehouses. In fact, every year in the United States, 10 billion, right, 10 billion cows, pigs, and chickens are being slaughtered for food. So what that works out to be is that every second in the United States, 300 animals are killed, just like that. So 300, 600, 900, 1,200. By the time I'm done talking today, there'll be over a million animals that have been slaughtered. And most of us don't even blink an eye. I mean, how is it possible that in the United States of America, we can kill, we can slaughter 300 animals every second and not question that because of the story we've been told. The story justifies the action. If you say it enough times, you actually convince yourself that's the truth. How many of you were taught as a child you need to eat meat to get protein? I know I was. How many of you were taught you need to drink cow's milk to get strong bones? Not dog milk, <laughs> not chimpanzee milk, not elephant milk, not rhino milk, not hippo milk, not tiger milk, not lion milk, not giraffe milk, not elephant milk. Did I say that already? I think you get the point. Not even our own mother's milk, but we need to drink cow's milk to get strong bones. The absurdity of drinking the milk from any other species and any other being besides our own mother, when it's said enough times, loses its absurdness. So all we're going to do today is find out if the matrix is telling the truth. Now, the first thing we've been taught is that our diet is natural. You know, we eat meat, dairy, and eggs, so therefore it must be natural. So let's find out. Now, you have two images on the wall. All right? Again, remember the Rorschach test. You have two images on the wall. I want you to tell me all the thoughts that come to mind when you see the image on the left. And don't be afraid to scream out. Nobody's going to uh, get sent to the principal. What do you see? Yum. Fresh, yum, sweet. All right? If I came into the room with a basket of strawberries that looked just like that, organic, and I put him on the chair right here, and now what would be your thoughts? Okay, same thoughts. What would you think if, if one of us got up and started chewing on the strawberries? Maybe we'd want to join in. If I come into the room with a basket of strawberries, how many of your mouth starts to salivate? Your mouth starts to water? If I take a strawberry and I put it under your nose, what do you smell? If I take a knife and I slice that strawberry in half and put that under your nose, now what do you smell? Notice how all the sensations remain the same. You see a strawberry and it looks like a strawberry. You smell a strawberry and it smells like a strawberry. And you take a bite out of a strawberry and surprise, surprise, it tastes like a strawberry. Banana? Exactly, it's a strawberry. But what thoughts come to mind when you see the image on the right? Cute. Cute. It's kind of a rigged audience. Um, you're, in a, you're in a vegan restaurant. Um, but you know, when I go to a classroom, you know, half the response, you'll get half the kids who say, oh, cute. Animal, pig, Wilbur, babe. So half the class will see an animal, and the other half of the class will see bacon, sausage, ham, pig's feet, pork, and hot dog. They'll see a food. It's one or the other. You're either seeing an animal or you're seeing food. Now, what would happen if I took one of the pigs living, brought him into the room right here, and put him, put him right in front of you? Does that change it? Now what do we see? And I mean, what would we think if one of, if one of us got up and started chewing on the pig? <laughs> Not very normal. Um, if I come into the room with a pig under my arm, how many of your mouth starts to salivate? Right? If I take a pig and I put it under your nose, what do you smell? You smell a pig. Just like if I took a dog and put it under your nose, you smell a dog. A cat, you smell a cat. If I took a knife and I sliced that pig in half and put that under your nose, now what do you smell? Blood. You smell the stench of death. You smell a rotting corpse, bacteria, decomposing flesh. You see, there's a process involved, and I'm here today to show you that process of how you convert this animal into this product. Why should it, why should it be kept a secret? Why should we not know what we're participating in and what we're putting in our body? Now. Let's make the situation slightly more realistic. If I were to put a pig on this side of the room, living, and a butcher's knife on, side, on the side of that room, I mean, how many people would be willing to pick up the knife and take the life of that animal? It's very rare, right? And if somebody did that, that's all right, but how many people in this room would try to stop that person from doing that? Right? Would we try that? Yeah. Of course. That's compassion. I mean, that is the greatest quality of the human race. There's no other species on this planet that has that level of compassion to extend to all living beings. But if you would stop somebody from killing a pig in front of you and then go home and have this for breakfast, well, that's called hypocrisy. You know, just because it comes in a nice neat package all dressed up in your supermarket, just because you didn't take the knife and shove it through their jugular, just because you didn't get blood in your clothes, and just because you didn't hear their screams doesn't mean you didn't participate in the killing. 
every time we buy this product, we are supporting somebody else doing what we ourselves wouldn't want to do, what we ourselves wouldn't want to see, and what we ourselves wouldn't want to hear. Now, if you still see bacon sauce in the hand when I bring a pig into the room, what happens when I change it to... Oh, one sec. I'm supposed to, like, not... There we go. All right. Oh, all right. It's the common response. No, I've never heard anybody say yum. Nobody ever sees dog feet, <laughs> hot dog. So why not? Why don't we see a food? Well, we've, we've been accustomed to view this animal as our pet. I mean, how many of you have a dog or a cat, right? How many of you have a pig? Not so much. All right, so, but there are other cultures. There are other cultures. Again, the, the cultural story for us is this is your pet. In another culture, certain parts of the world, they eat cats and dogs. That's their culture. That's their story they've been told. And how do we feel about that? A lot of people think it's disgusting. right? I imagine every one of you probably thinks it's disgusting to eat a dog. Why would it be disgusting to eat this animal and not disgusting to eat this animal? Why would it be wrong to eat this animal and right to eat this animal? And most importantly, why would it be wrong to kill this animal and right to kill this animal. Culture. It's culture. It's the story. It's the matrix that we've been told. One culture sees this as a pet, this is a food. Another culture might see this as a pet, and this is a food. Another culture might see them both as food. Certain parts of India, the cow is sacred. They would never think about eating a cow in certain parts of India. Is that wrong? Is that unnatural? That's just the story they've been told. But culture is just a story. That's all it is. It's just make-believe. What I'm concerned with is what is natural to the human species. Because every culture has a different story. But you take somebody from Asia, Africa, South America, North America, Europe, and we're all the same species. We're all human beings. So let's take a three-year-old from any country in the world, and you put that three-year-old in a room, and you line up five animals in front of that three-year-old. A pig, a dog, a cow, a cat, and a chicken. Do you think the three-year-old is going to know which one to eat and which one to pet? What's the three-year-old most likely going to do, or try to do? Play with them all. He's going to try to play with them all. The three-year-old has to be taught, no, 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 no. Don't play with him. Eat him. Play with him. Pet him. That's what we were taught. We didn't choose our diet. Our diet is a learned behavior. We were raised to perceive this animal as your pet and this animal as your food. But that's not the natural perception. The natural perception is that they're all of our, our companions. So. Our parents chose our diet based upon the cultural story. And if you have children, you base their diet on the cultural story being told, which is the same story. Now, let me give you another example. If you take a baby, and you put a baby in a crib, and you put on the, uh, the right side a baby chick, and on the left side an apple, which one do you think the baby's going to try to play with, and which one do you think the baby's going to try to eat? Most likely, I put the inanimate object, in this case, the apple, in his or her mouth. And if the baby, you know, most likely will be piqued by the interest of the thing moving, in this case, the thing being actually a living being in, in the chick. Now, if the baby tries to eat the chick, what's the chick going to do? He's going to run away or peck at him. Now, if you walked into a room with a baby in a crib, playing with an apple and chewing on the head of a live chick, what would you think of that baby? Like demon baby? You can allow, you can allow that you can allow that demon baby to play with your baby instead of a play date? Probably not. So if it's not alright for a baby to cause harm to an animal, even when they don't know any better, why does it become more acceptable as we get older when we do know the difference between an apple and a baby chick? The question is, do we find it acceptable to cause harm to an animal? Well let's find out. If you don't walk outside right now and you saw somebody taking a baseball bat to a, a dog's head, what would you do? You, you, you take action. At the very least, you'd call the police because you recognize that as a violation of this animal's right to be free from harm. We're all given that right at birth. Every animal on this planet, whether it's a mammal, whether it's an amphibian, whether it's uh, a bird, a reptile, a fish, an insect, we're all earthlings, human beings as well. We are all earthlings. And what do all earthlings have in common? Two things. We all want to live. We all desire to live. That is what is, creates the equality in all of us. We all want to live. And the second thing is we all avoid pain. Those two things make us equal. From the largest land animal on earth, the elephant, to the smallest, the insect, the ant, and everything in between, from the dog, the pig, to the human being, we all desire to live and we all avoid pain. Now, if you were to walk outside right now and you saw somebody taking a, 
a baseball bat to a pig's head, would your emotional response not be the exact same thing? Of course. Because the question for you is, what's the difference? What's the difference between the two? Right? Is there a difference? You might think one is cuter than the other, but that says more about you than anything about these two animals. You know, a lot of kids will say, well, the nose looks different. But I say, they go, but they both got a nose to smell. Some kids will say, well, he's got hooves and he's got paws. I say they both got feet to walk and run. Some kids say, well, his ears are going up and his ears are flappy. They both got two ears to hear. They both got two eyes to see. They both got a heart to beat and a mind to think. And the reason why we would take action for both of them is because we recognize the equality between them and not the difference. Any difference is insignificant. The similarities, though, are striking. We know they're equal. Yet every time we sit down for a meal, we create that separation. We create that inequality. It's just like we knew the two circles were equal, red and blue. But all it takes is somebody to tell you a story. Now, the, what we most importantly recognize is that all animals have feelings. But how do we know? I mean, how do we really know? Or how do we even know that humans have feelings? Well, I mean, of these feelings, what's most important to you? Happiness, right? How do you know if somebody's happy? If I said to you right now, this is the happiest moment in my life, would you believe me? Hopefully not. No offense. So how are you going to tell if somebody's happy? They're smiling. They're laughing. I can take somebody in, in this room who, who doesn't speak your language, but you can tell how they're, they're feeling by their expressions, the sounds. It doesn't have to do with a language, though. What about other animals? Well, they wag their tail, they bark, they jump up and down, they play with each other, they lick. So all these are signs of how they feel. What about pain, though? If I said to you right now, my right hand is killing me, would you believe me? I haven't given you any signs. It might, though. It might be killing me. There's only one person in this room who knows if it's actually killing me. That's me, of course. If I say, let's say I was to trip over my feet here, though, and nail my head against the side of this table, start bleeding profusely out of my head, and I'm screaming on the ground, would you believe I'm in pain? Of course, I'm showing the signs. Here's a test. You take your hand, you put it over a flame, what happens? Burns, right? What's your reaction? Pull back and scream. You take a dog's paw, put it over a flame. What's his reaction? Same thing. Pull back and scream. You take a pig's leg, put it over a flame. Same reaction. You take a dog, a pig, a cow, a chicken, a goat, a duck, a horse, a rat, a mouse, any animal that's living, put a body part of the flame, they all have the same reaction. You take a fish out of water, and what's their reaction? Start flopping around. Why? They can't breathe. You want to know what it feels like to be a fish out of water? Have your, have your loved one. Put your, put your head under water and not let go. It really wouldn't be your loved one, though, if they're doing that. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Of course fish have feelings. They're not, they're not vegetables. If you take a vegetable, you take a plant, you take a strawberry, and you put it over a flame, and what happens? It melts. It doesn't have feet to run away. It doesn't have a mouth to scream, a nose to smell, eyes to see, ears to hear, a heart to beat, and a mind to think. And, a lot of kids will like to give this one. Before you say, well, plants have feelings, they don't have a nervous system. They don't have a nervous system. Without a nervous system, they can't feel pain and happiness the way that animals and humans can. So the question is, when did we learn this? When did we learn that animals have feelings? Hopefully this isn't the first day that you learned this, right? When you were younger, right? And how did you learn it? Maybe you had a cat or dog. All you have to do is go outside and just experience any of the animals outside. And If they run from you, it means they're scared. If they come up to you, you probably have food or something and they want it. So we understand this through the experiences we have. In fact, think about the books that were read to you as a child, the songs you listened to, and how about the movies? Now think about the movies we show to our kids. What do all these movies have in common? What are they about? What kind of animals? Farmed animals. Even fish are being farmed. You have pigs, chickens, cows, and fish. These are all the animals we eat. What's the common theme in these movies? They're running. Yeah, they're being saved. No animal wants to die. No animal wants to be dinner on your plate. And we, you know, we root for these animals. You take even the biggest pork eater in the world, he's, he's rooting for Wilbur. Nobody wants to see Wilbur made into bacon at the end of that film. Chicken Run. You know, we root for the chickens. Now, I guarantee there are a thousand people you know, watching Chicken Run. Go, chickens, go. Why are you eating a KFC bucket of chicken wings? Because they're not making that connection. Babe, how many kids watch the movie Babe, fall in love with Babe, and then go home and are fed Babe unknowingly by their parents? So we're teaching kids to love these animals but eat them too. And this is the closest thing you'll come to see their reality in the matrix, in the story we've told ourselves. And most of the times, unfortunately, the closest thing we'll come to is in cartoon form. And what is it? By Pixar and, and, and Disney, nonetheless. Um, but today we step outside the matrix. And generally speaking, when I go into a high school classroom, I show Meet Your Meat. If you haven't seen this video, if you still are eating meat, dairy, um, eggs, fish, 
take a look at uh, meat.org, M-E-A-T.org, and you can see the uh, conditions that these animals live in. Now, I'm not going to show you that. It's, it's, uh, every time I show it to adults, they just leave. Uh, they don't come back. So um, I'm going to show you a three-minute video, again, by the, the same people that put on the first video, Farm Sanctuary. Um, it's three minutes. Um, if you don't want to watch it, you don't have to. Um, but this is where 90 to 95% of the meat, dairy, and eggs that we're consuming in the United States are coming from. And I mean, really, if you have a problem watching it, but you don't have a problem eating it, you know, why the disconnect there? Um, but this isn't just about animal rights. This is also a health issue, and that's the second part of the presentation we'll, we'll, we'll talk about after the video. The question is, do these animals look healthy? Do the conditions they're living in look healthy? Because if the animals don't look healthy to you, why would you want to put a sick animal into your body? Um, one last thing before I show the video. A lot of people say, well, what about, what about you know, milk? There doesn't seem to be any harm in, in raising cows for milk. Notice the very first scene in this video of uh, the dairy cows. And you're going to actually see uh, a cow giving birth. And notice what happens to her calf. And notice her response. If I could talk to animals that are being confined and, and abused now in factory farms, I would say I'm sorry for what we're doing to you. Um, I wish it wasn't this way, and I, I'm doing everything I know to stop it, and um, hopefully we will be able to stop it. There's not really a whole lot of good you can say. I mean, you just gotta, um, just gotta hope that it can stop, and hope that people will recognize the harm we're causing and will choose a different way. Meat, milk, and eggs come from real animals. They don't just come from the grocery store. And these animals desire to live and they want to be free of pain and suffering and fear. And on today's farms, these animals only know fear and pain at human hands. They never know human kindness. They never know mercy. And when people buy these products, they are unwittingly supporting that type of cruelty and that type of callousness. The workers, they have to lose part of their heart. You know, they have to lose, they have to shut their eyes to certain aspects of what they're doing. Can you imagine what it would be like to cut the throats of animals for eight hours a day? It's a bloody, violent job, and nobody should have to do it. I don't know what it means that, you know, we can participate in such cruelty without paying attention to it, without caring about it, without wanting to do different. <laughs> Citizens want to assume that animals will be treated humanely, that there are laws on the books to prevent cruelty, uh, and people are usually surprised to learn there aren't. If people looked at what was happening, they'd be appalled. Most people would not support the type of abuse that has become common on factory farms. The common response is, why is this happening? And there's a very simple explanation for why it, why it does happen. Um, if you were to walk outside right now, if you walk down US 1 and you walk further down, let's say you came to a restaurant that just opened up, right? They were serving cats and dogs. That was their main item on the menu. How many of you would be out there right now protesting? I guarantee, before the day would be over, you would have that place shut down, right? Walk down the street, a few blocks down, you'll come to a steakhouse. I don't see anybody protesting. I don't see that place being shut down. Why? Because, because we've been taught to perceive this animal to be different from this animal. And veganism is simply changing your perception. That's it. That's all it is. You just change your perception. We don't have to participate in this. This is not necessary. A lot of people will say to me, well, what about you know, if we just created better conditions? What I'm saying to you is it's not necessary to kill an animal. You don't have to kill animals. We don't have to drink their milk. We don't have to eat their eggs. It's just not necessary. I mean, people talk about humane slaughter. How do you, how do you slaughter something humanely? I mean, is that like where you rub their belly, give them some milk and cookies, and you chop their head off? If I did that to one of you, would everybody be like, well, at least you died humanely. You can't do anything violent 
humanely? I mean, if I were to, can I humanely rob you? Humanely rape you? What, is, what does humane theft look like? Is that where I come up to you and I say, hey, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to come up here and take your uh, wallet, put it on the table right here. Take all the credit cards, cash, everything, put it on the table right there. Pretty pleased with a cherry on top. Would that be humane theft? I mean, would everybody be like, hey, if I'm going to get robbed, I want him to do it. He's pretty nice about it. Of course not. Nobody wants to be robbed. Nobody wants to be killed. Nobody wants to be raped. Um, it's not necessary. You think about it this way. How many of you do not, do not own a fur coat? Raise your hand if you don't, or don't own a fur coat. Yeah, that's what I thought. Why? Why don't you own a fur coat? Because it's cruel and unnecessary. Because it's cruel and unnecessary. What about if I said to you, you know what? Um, we're going to take some mix, right? We're going to raise them for, you know, fur coat. We're going we're gonna to raise them, but we're going we're gonna, to, you know, give them a lot of room. We're going to cage free, free range, organic food. They're going to, you know, they're going to live like kings and queens. Um, until we kill them, of course. You know, after, after a few, few weeks, a few months, you know, they won't live to their natural age, but we're going to create humane fur. Would that be acceptable? Would you go out and buy a fur coat? No, because it's not necessary. A fur coat is not necessary, especially here in Florida, but it's not necessary anywhere. You don't need a fur coat to survive. You don't need to eat animals to survive. It's not necessary. It's just sugarcoating something, humane slaughter. So let's take a look at what we are participating in. This is a battery cage, all right? It's literally the size of a milk crate, just like this. You take four to six hens, you put them in a crate this size, and you burn their beaks off. Why? Because in these conditions, they become aggressive. You know, it'd be like if I took everybody in the first and second row, put you in that corner, and sealed it off. I kept you there for, you know, 48 hours straight. I guarantee you're not going to remain friends for that long. You want more space. So they're denied the ability to do what's natural to them, spread their wings, forage. So how does the industry solve this problem? Cage free, free range. I mean, that sounds pretty good. Who in this room doesn't want to live free, right? This is a cage free farm in Virginia. It's just the label. It's just the label. It makes us feel better about what we're participating in, but it means absolutely nothing to the animal. Cage free simply means you can take 500 hens and put them in this room. According to the industry, that is Cage free. Question is, what is your definition of freedom? Does this apply? Now, even on the you know, old McDonald's farm that we all have stuck in our head, even if you find that magical farm and good luck finding it, it doesn't matter. Because all male chicks born in the egg industry are thrown out. Literally. Why? It seems kind of wasteful. Why throw out the male chicks? They don't fit into the equation. They don't serve any purpose to the industry. So we cage them, we debeak them. We still cage them, call, call it freedom though. We can still debeak them in these conditions and we throw out all the male tricks, whether it's cage free, free range or organic. Whoops, that was the wrong way. Also that we can have this. Well, might as well get to know what it is. What is an egg? A lot of people think it's a baby chick. It's not a baby chick. A lot of people think it's a fetus. It's not a fetus, it's not an embryo, which is good. I mean, I don't know why anybody would want to eat a fetus or an embryo in the first place. So what is it? Well, it's an unfertilized egg. That doesn't sound that bad at all. All right. Well, once a month, every woman in this room, or maybe not every woman in this room, um, sheds, or at some point, sheds an unfertilized egg. What is that called? Period. Congratulations. <laughs> You're eating a hen period. It's the menstruation cycle discharge of a hen. Now, I'm not going to eat a woman's period, just like, why should I have a hen period? There's no need to eat any period from any living being. It's disgusting, and, you know, we should call it what it is. I mean, if we were just, you know, at the, when we were young, when we were kids, and, you know, our parents said, hey, you want some scrambled hen periods for breakfast, uh, I'll mean, pass. You know? It's like honey. What is honey? Yeah, it's, it's vomit. It's, it's regurgitated throw up. They, they, they throw up for their own cells. They take the nectar, they digest it, and they throw up. And it's for their own cells. They're not producing it for us. We call it honey because who, who in their right mind would want to buy a product called bee vomit? I mean, you know, you put vomit next to any, any, any product in the supermarket and I guarantee it's not going to sell. It doesn't take a business aspect to realize that. All right. What about milk? Well, even your happy cows in California are hooked up to machines. This is, this is the way it is. All right. Now, when does a cow start producing milk? During, during pregnancy. She starts lactating during pregnancy, right? That's fine. I mean, I've, I've been to a lot of schools and I'll get even high school teachers who will say, huh, I didn't know that. I just thought there was this magical cow that just produced milk. <laughs> it's like, okay, all whole mammals produce milk when they're pregnant. And how does she become pregnant? 
Well, they, you know, like, we like to think they get to have sex, right? At the very least, they get the pleasure of sex. But there's no sex on the farm. The farmer is not going to wait for a cow and a bull to get it on. He's not going to set the mood, light some candles, put on Barry White. It's a business. He's running a business, you know? And the business is not in the welfare of the animal. It's in producing a profit. So how do you get a cow pregnant without a bull? Artificially inseminate them. If you were to artificially inseminate a woman without a consent, what would that be called? Rape. I am not saying a woman is a cow, but I am saying rape is rape. I mean, just look up the definition of rape. Exerting your power over another sexually. So what's your definition of another? Does that only apply to women? How about men? How about other beings? Well, now she's pregnant. She gives birth. What happens to her baby? All male calves born in the dairy industry, like the, if you were here in the beginning, the saving Billy, all male calves born in the dairy industry are immediately taken away from their mother, chained by the neck to a crate, deprived of their mother's milk, fed an inefficient diet so that their body become anemic, so lack of iron. They will never be able to turn around, will never see the light of day. Every glass of milk supports this industry. And some people say, well, veal is the cruelest industry, or foie gras, where they shove a pipe down a, a duck's throat. I mean, cruelest industry. How, how, do you, how do you put pain in some kind of like, okay, well, it's pretty bad right here, but it's not so bad here. Pain is pain. Suffering is suffering. Don't categorize it. This is all suffering for these animals. Why do they do that to the male calves? Just like the male chicks. They don't fit into the equation. They don't produce the milk. If you're drinking cow's milk, the only reason is because a calf chained to a box isn't. Now, what about the female calves? they too will be taken away from the mother. Why? Why would, why would the, the, the female calf that will grow up to be like her mother, which is a constant cycle of uh, impregnation, birth, and milking, why would she be taken away from the mother? Right, and we want the milk. How do you think it makes a cow feel to have her baby torn away from her? Anybody who's a parent, how would you feel if you had your baby torn away from you? All milk, whether it's organic, meaning they don't put in you know, the hormones and the pesticides, doesn't matter. All milk is stress milk. That's not something you pasteurize out of the, the milk. It's part of it. It's part of the, it's like it's part of the meat, part of the, part of the cheese. It's part of what you're drinking. It's stress. Now, biologically speaking, who is a cow producing milk for? Biologically speaking. It's the baby. The baby, not for us. Just like, you know, when your mom was pregnant with you, who was she producing milk for? It was for you. It wasn't your daddy. It wasn't the neighbor. It wasn't the dog or the cat. It was for you. All mammals produce milk for their young. Where do all these animals get their milk from? And when do they stop consuming milk? We're the only species on this planet to take the milk from another animal, and we're the only species on this planet to continue drinking milk after infancy. And if you really don't think it's that weird, because people, like, people say, well, you don't, you don't eat cheese. Cheese is just spoiled milk. You don't eat, you don't eat cheese. You don't drink cow's milk. That's, that's extreme. That's crazy. Is it really that extreme to not take the milk from another animal? I mean, and if you don't think it's that extreme, if I brought a pregnant woman into the room right now, how many of you would want to drink her milk? You're not. You're not, you're not a baby. It is extreme. Now, if cow's milk is meant for a calf, if cow's milk is biologically meant for a calf, why would it be necessary for humans to drink? It's not. Cow's milk is no more necessary than drinking dog milk, chimp milk pig milk or elephant milk. The only milk you need was from your mother when you were a baby. You're not a baby anymore. You're not a cow. You're not a calf. Well, what about if I said to you, you know, you're walking in Publix, Whole Foods, Winn-Dixie, maybe Winn-Dixie more likely, um, and you come across not cow milk, but chimpanzee milk. That's, that's why I said Winn-Dixie. Um, no offense. No offense to shop at Winn-Dixie. I just, I don't, I can't picture, well, I don't know, maybe Whole Foods. But, um, all right, so chimpanzee milk, right? How many of you would buy it? Probably not, right? That's disgusting. Why would it be disgusting to take the milk from one animal, but not the disgusting to take the milk from another animal? In fact, if you're drinking cow's milk and you find chimpanzee milk, I'd say make the switch. It makes more sense. <laughs> Why would it make more sense to take the milk of a chimpanzee? Hey, look, if you're going to take the milk from any animal, wouldn't you want to take the milk from an animal that shares 98% of our DNA, 99%? I mean, doesn't that seem to be the logical conclusion? I, I choose you. That would seem the logical conclusion. What about your dog? If your dog was pregnant right now and I said, I'll pasteurize your dog's milk, would you want to drink it? That's disgusting and that's absurd. It is disgusting and absurd. No more disgusting and absurd than drinking cow's milk, though. In fact, if you have a dog, it actually makes more sense to drink dog milk than cow milk. Why is that? Well, how many of you have a large dog? Okay. How much does your dog weigh? 110. 110. Wow, what kind of dog? 
What kind of dog? American Bulldog. There we go. All right, 110 pounds. That's pretty close to the human weight, right? 110 pounds? That seems to make sense. This animal weighs 2,000 pounds. Why put a product meant for a 2,000 pound animal into this? You know, baby doesn't even know why. All right. A baby, on average, weighs seven pounds at birth. I really don't know where I'm supposed to be pointing this. It's like a magical wand. There we go. Um, a calf weighs 90 pounds at birth. At birth, 90 pounds. Baby, seven pounds. Calf, 90 pounds. The calf will grow to 500 pounds in under a year, in nine months. 410 pounds in under a year. What makes them grow so large so fast? The milk. But of course, they're not getting the milk. And if it's not organic, what are they getting? Hormones. They're getting steroids. Again, that's not something you pasteurize out of the milk. And how do you keep animals healthy in these conditions? You pump them up with antibiotics. 70% of the antibiotics produced in the United States are fed to farm animals. That's not good. Right? That is not good. You know, you wonder why so many people are, are dying in the hospitals? They get some infection and they take these antibiotics and they don't work anymore. So, how do, we, how do we justify, how do we actually justify putting a product meant for a 2,000 pound animal, they grow to 2,000 pounds in two years, into this? Well, the story. Once again, the story justifies the action. Say it enough times, you convince yourself it's the truth. Every story has an author. Who is the author of this story? Dairy. Right. And what is the ultimate goal of the dairy industry? I mean, why would the dairy, be, the dairy industry be some holier-than-thou company? I mean, if I said to you, cigarettes, it does a body good, you'd probably say, I work for the cigarette company, right? I mean, none of us would believe that. But why believe this? And if you believe that milk does a body good, why would 75% of the human population be lactose intolerant? Do you know what that means? That means three out of every four people on this planet, when they drink milk, they suffer from one of these symptoms. Diarrhea, stomach ache, gassiness, bloated, ear infection, excess mucus. And that's normal. If you suffer from any of these symptoms, Stop drinking cow's milk. Your body's trying to talk to you. Your body's saying, look, I can't do it anymore. Stop. Listen to your body. Your body knows best. Of course, the dairy industry will come up with a new product called, what, lactate? They just, they just, they just put, they put the enzyme. You see, the reason why most people are lactose intolerant is because all mammals, and human beings are mammals, have an enzyme known as lactase. Put an A right there. That enzyme breaks down the sugar known as lactose. As we mature, we lose that enzyme. So it's normal to be lactose intolerant. But of course, the dairy industry starts injecting the enzyme into it. That's not normal. That's not natural. And again, you're going against what your body is telling you. You know, the dairy industry says, listen to us. We know better than your body. They don't. Your body knows best. You are your best doctor. But it must be good for kids, though, right? I mean, because every school I've been into, elementary, middle, and high school, is all one product being served. What product is that? Milk. Milk. Well, what's the number one cause of food allergies among infants and children? Anybody want to take a wild guess? No, no shit. All right, so <laughs> if most people on this planet can't consume milk, and most people, most children and infants, are, if they have an allergy, it's, it's from milk, cow's milk, and not, not peanuts, but cow's milk. Why again are we drinking this? What, what, what have we been told? Drink milk, get strong bones. Does a body good. What does a body good? Calcium does a body good. The question is, is this the best source of calcium? Let's find out. Countries that consume the most milk. What countries drink the most milk? The US. I go into classrooms and you get kids being like, Florida. Right. Um, <laughs> Norway would be on this list as well. Um, what is osteoporosis? It's a, it's a loss of bone density. It's literally weak bones. Remember what you've been taught. Drink cow's milk, get strong bones. What countries have the highest rate of osteoporosis? All right, well, either it's just a random coincidence or there's more to it. The more to it is this. Any product that comes from an animal has animal protein. That makes sense. Animal product, animal protein. Well, that animal protein, you know, protein is the amino acids, the building blocks of protein. Those amino acids, which are good, unfortunately, though, they're high in sulfur. So you want amino acids, but the problem with animal protein is that those amino acids are high in sulfur. When you put that in your body, your body becomes acidic. You're, you're making your, your, your body acidic, and your body's not meant to be acidic. It's meant to be alkaline, right? The pH balance is going lower than what it should be. 
So how does your body compensate? Well, they have to neutralize the acidity. So what do they do? They start releasing calcium from the bones. So the more cow's milk you drink, according to these statistics, the weaker your bones can actually become. The more animal protein you eat, the weaker your bones can actually become. In fact, if you look at countries in Africa and Asia, they don't suffer from very high rates of osteoporosis. They also don't drink very much cow's milk, if none at all, and they also don't eat as much animal protein. Now, kids will say, yeah, but wait a second, what do I put on my cereal? Problem solved. The diet for you the chance to like, diagnose them, that's not a problem. Right, it's because this information isn't out, I mean, it's out there, but people aren't being taught it. And this is, you know, this is basically the alternative perspective. And, you know, you can do your own research and find out if what I'm saying is uh, valid or not. But, I mean, you can go with these alternative milks. And a lot of people are like, fake meats and fake milks. No, they're not fake, they're real, right? These are real products, and they come from plants. You have the soy milk, um, the almond milk, rice milk, coconut milk, oat milk. You can do hemp milk, high in protein. Um, so these are alternatives that you can do. Um, and I know you've all heard of, a, uh, of a, a taste test, right? Well, let's do a health test, all right? So here we have the milk that comes from an animal, and here we have the milk that comes from a plant, a soybean. All right, there is 150 milligrams of calcium per half a glass in, in your cow's milk. How many do you think is in your soy milk? It's the same. It's 150. It's the exact same in a half glass. All right, so what's the difference? Well, this comes from an animal, and once again, animal protein can leach calcium out of the bones, and all animal products meat, dairy, eggs, fish, is high in cholesterol. It has cholesterol, and your body naturally makes cholesterol. You don't need to put any more cholesterol in your body. So this has cholesterol. This doesn't. All plant products don't have any cholesterol. And all plant products, everything you see up here, everything you see over there on the table, fruits, vegetables, rice, beans, has fiber. Has fiber. So plants have fiber and no <laughs> cholesterol. Animal products, no fiber and high in cholesterol. So let, again, let's do a health test. High in cholesterol, no fiber. High in fiber, no cholesterol. Which one do you think is the, the safer choice? I rest my case. All right. Um, but you don't have to do this. I mean, human beings don't really need to drink anything besides water. I mean, that's really all we need to be drinking. And you can have your orange juice and your apple juice, but we just need water. Now, again, this is for the cereal. Um, but you can get all your calcium from plants. I mean, just think about it. What is the largest and strongest land animal on Earth? An elephant. It weighs 10,000 pounds. You know what his diet consists of? That's it. I don't know if he's eating spinach, but um, it's his plants. It's plants. You're going to tell an elephant that he, you know, his bones look a little weak? He needs to be drinking the milk of a cow? You get all your calcium from this. Now, a lot of people say to me, ah, oh, man, but you know what? I get it, but man, I, I love my cheese. I can't give up cheese. Look, I tell people this. If you're going to give up any product, give up dairy. Dairy is the worst. I mean, the greatest trick ever pulled was convincing people they need to drink milk. Dairy is the worst in terms of the cruelty inflicted upon the animals. They suffer for a longer period of time, and it's just completely unnatural and unhealthy. It is unhealthy. And there's a reason why people love their cheese and their milk. It's meant to be addictive. I mean, just think about it. You know, it, it might be hard. I can't remember. But uh, you know, when we were younger, most likely we were nursing from our mother, right, from her milk. It has to be addictive. The child wants to ha has to want to have more. Why? Because this is the greatest growth spurt in their life. This is the greatest growth spurt that you ever had were when you were a baby drinking your mother's milk. Same for all other animals. And as we get older, our parents, including the animal parents, wean their children off of it. So you're supposed to, de you're supposed to desire it. You're supposed to want it, and then you get weaned off of it. They're selling a product. It's addictive. It's addictive. It has a chemical called casomorphine. When you digest it, that chemical is released. Casomorphine. Morphine. It makes you giddy. It makes you want more. It makes your brain think, eat more, eat more. And your body is saying, I can't. I can't digest it properly. So you are addicted. And the first step to what uh, recovery is to acknowledge it. 68% <laughs> of all diseases in the United States are diet related. This is a government statistic. And what that means is that, you know, especially when I talk to a high school class where my audience is 99% you know, eating meat, dairy, and eggs, if you don't change your food choices, you might become part of the statistic. I mean, it's what, three out of every five people. This is a government statistic. In fact, what are the leading causes of death in the United States? What are the top three? Cancer, heart disease, strokes. Diabetes is number six. All right? Every 40 seconds, somebody suffers a stroke in the United States. 
Right? That's the American uh, Stroke um, Association. Um, the American Heart Association says that every 24 seconds, somebody suffers a heart attack in the United States. And uh, the Institute for Cancer Research says that every day, 3,400 people in the United States are diagnosed with cancer. 3,400 people every day, new people. How many people in this room know somebody or knew somebody who has or had cancer? Raise your hand. Take a look around you. Isn't that we find this a little disturbing? I mean, we might be living longer, but we're living longer with diseases that haven't been around, that, that, that they're more rampant than they ever have been. In fact, I've been reading that they say that the children today, the young generation today, will die at a younger age than their parents. Meaning that, you know, if your parents live into 75, they might die at 70. And we're just going down. How is that possible? In fact, is the 68% coming from the image on the right or the left? Right. I mean, you ever heard of somebody suffering a heart attack because they had too many fruits and vegetables? <laughs> it's unheard of. A key to a healthy diet is a variety of foods and a variety of colors. How much variety do you really see? In fact, why, why is this causing most of the death and disease? Because despite what we've been told, despite what we've been taught, we look nothing like omnivores, biologically speaking. We don't look anything like carnivores. We look identical, biologically speaking, to our brother from another mother. We look like gorillas. We look like the great apes. We look like the horses, the cows, the giraffes, the elephants, the zebras. How so? Our teeth. Not my teeth, but. Um, canines. I love when people say, what about our canines? Really? You really think they're very sharp? I mean, if, I, if we had like sharp canines, like our cats and dogs, I mean, if you really think you have canine teeth that are sharp, take a look at your cat or dog. I mean, would we be using knives and forks if we had these, right? Um, we have more teeth. Why? We chew our food. You know, tonight when you're feeding your cat or dog, notice what they do. Limited chewing, mostly swallowing. Our jaw goes like this. We grind our food. Their jaw opens up wide. In fact, if you want to know what humane slaughter looks like, here it is. Look at the animal kingdom. The fastest land animal is the cheetah. It goes 70 miles per hour. Now, a tiger can go about, I think it's about 35, 40 miles per hour. It's pretty quick. Then you have the deer, the antelope, the gazelle. Not as fast, right? So you have carnivores, tiger, cheetah, jaguar, and then you have the deer, antelope, um, and the gazelle. So herbivores, carnivores. Now, the carnivores are quicker but what's, what's the difference here? We got on the right side, all right, I guess it would be your left side, um, the carnivores are all the track and field stars. Quick sprint, out of breath. They don't have very much endurance. On the left side, or again, the right side for you, this would be the herbivores, which don't have as much speed, but have more endur endurance. They are the cross-country runners. So what, what we like to assume, or maybe not we don't like to assume, but Logic would say, okay, that the faster animal would always get his prey. But that's not the case. That's not the case because you have track and field versus cross country. So that means that the tiger is only successful in the hunt 20% of the time. That means 8 out of every 10 deer will escape the slaughter. So what kind of deer will the tiger be able to capture? The sick, the weak, the injured, the lost, the old, the young. This animal weeds out the weak. We're not doing anything like that. In fact, if we were meant to be on top of the food chain, don't you think we would have some claws to rip through flesh? I mean, if I brought a pig into the room and asked you to kill the pig with your claws, the pig would probably enjoy it more than anything else. <laughs> and this is perhaps most important. Your intestines and symbol would be my representative. Um, small intestines, large intestines, also known as the colon, small and large. Now, your, your intestines combined, large and small, make up 10 times your body size, your body being your mouth, your anus, which is about 3 feet. Now multiply that by 10, and you have 30 feet of intestines in your stomach. And it's, you know, from this wall through that door. 30 feet of intestines in your stomach. Carnivores, omnivores, it's about 3 to 6 times their body length. So let's say that Simba, it would be about, you know, anywhere from 15 to 20 feet. 30 feet, 15 feet. Whose food gets traveled out quicker? Simba's, which is good, because you can call it bacon as much as you want, but once it's in your body, it's no longer bacon. It's decomposing flesh. It's bacteria. And it builds up, and they have, by the way, 10 times the amount of hydrochloric acid to break it down. So we don't even have the pH balance of the enzymes that break it down properly. So what happens? It leads to clogged arteries, which leads to heart disease, heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, and obesity. You ever heard of a tiger suffering from high blood pressure, high cholesterol, strokes, obesity? You know why these animals don't suffer from these diseases? Because they eat what's natural to their anatomy. When it comes to diet, we are the dumbest species on this planet. What do these two things have in common? Mercury. 
mercury. In fact, there's a warning label. There's a warning label on fish. I don't know if you've ever seen it. You know what it says? Certain people should consume it, men or women. Pregnant women. All right. Hopefully it's not pregnant men. All right, pregnant nursing women, women who may become pregnant, young children should not eat the following fish, including tuna, because nearly all fish and seafood contain some amount of mercury, chemicals known to cause cancer, birth defects, and reproductive harm. What else does the government tell women not to consume when they're pregnant? Alcohol, cigarettes, and drugs. So basically, the government's saying, hey, look, if you're thinking about becoming pregnant, lay off the drugs for a little bit and stop eating fish. If it can do that much harm to a woman, why would anybody want to consume it? And I mean, do I really need to, you know, say, at this point, do any one of us want to touch any food that comes from the sea? Mm. All you got to do is turn on the news. Open up a newspaper. And what do you see? Oil spill. Why? Why would you want to put this? I mean, here's how it works. You take, you take a small fish in the Gulf right now, right? Very, very small fish. That small fish is inevitably going to swallow some oil. It's going to swim further out, maybe miles away from, from the spill. And will get eaten by a larger fish. And then that larger fish is now contaminated and will swim out even further. And that larger fish will then get eaten by even a larger fish. Now that even larger fish is contaminated with oil. And then we catch that even larger fish, and then we eat it. Cooking the animal is not going to get rid of the oil. It becomes part of the meat. So why do we consume it, though? Why do we consume you know, this, this, this flesh of an animal? What have we been told? You need to eat meat to get protein. Protein, right? But how many grams of protein are we supposed to get? Does anybody know? Okay, in, in terms of grams per day? It'd be about, World Health Organization says 40 to 50, about that. 40 would be for the average female adult, uh, 50 would be for the average male adult. But it's funny how we don't tell that to kids. I mean, I only learned this recently myself, too. I mean, you know, going through my whole life and never really bothering to find out, and nobody ever bothered to tell me. It's like, you know, saying, here, have the keys to my car, go, you know, pick up some stuff from me, go get my groceries. But I didn't teach you how to drive the car. Teaching kids, yeah, you got to eat it, but not teaching them how or how much. Now, again, let me show you how easy it is to get protein, all right, especially here in the United States. All right, your standard American diet for breakfast, you got your bacon, you got your cow's milk, and you got your hen periods. All right, how many slices, how many slices of bacon would you want? Now, I know you might not eat bacon now, but how many slices do you remember as a kid, maybe? Maybe two? Okay, each slice has five grams, two times five. All right, how many eggs would you want? Two, each egg has six grams. So what do we got? 12 plus 10, 22. How many glasses of milk? One glass. Each glass is 8 grams. So you are at what? 30. 30. You're not even done with breakfast. That's not including the, the, the toast with cow butter you might put on it. So you're not even done with breakfast, and you're almost at the limit. The average American does not need to worry about getting enough protein. They need to worry about getting too much protein. That's why the United States has the highest rates of obesity in the entire world. All right? I mean, people all the time say, James, wait, you don't eat meat. Where do you get your protein from? Like all of a sudden, like holy shit, like it's all of a sudden dawned on me, like I have been without protein for the last eight years. Let's go to McDonald's and get a Big Mac. I'm, like I'm about to fall down or something or pass out. Um, have you ever heard of somebody in the United States suffering from a lack of protein and going to the hospital? It's unheard of. You know, I, I, it's funny even dealing with kids. You know, I have a kid say, you know, I, I tried to go vegan for a day and I got really sick. It's like, what? It's like, it's like, it's like, you know, like people say, oh, I know somebody who was vegan who was sick. Really? I know tons of meat eaters who are sick. I mean, like, yeah, you can be an unhealthy vegan. What I'm telling you is it doesn't matter if you're eating meat, dairy, eggs, fish, or you're eating a plant-based diet. You should know what you're putting in your body. You should know how, how many grams of protein you're getting. You know, you know the amount of iron, calcium that you're getting. Um, and by the way, people say omega-3 from fish. You can get that from you know, the seeds, the nuts. You can get that from other things. Uh, flax seeds is a very good example. Um, think about this. These are the largest and strongest land animals on Earth. And what does their diet consist of? Plants. You're in good company if you're only eating plants. And what's, full, what's so ironic about this is that the large and strongest land animals, not only do they not just, just eat a plant-based diet, they also live the longest. I mean, this animal can live to 70 years. They can live to about 50 to 60 years. The gorilla about 50 years in the wild. And their diet consists of nothing but plants. I mean, you're going to tell any of them they're missing out in protein? I mean, th th this animal has 10 times the upper body strength of the average male adult. And where is he getting all his protein from? From this. His diet consists of roots, shoots, bamboo, and banana. He's getting all his calcium, all his iron, all his vitamins, all his minerals, the amino acids from this. You get everything. Everything. Here's the new food pyramid. All right? 
there's two things. Your body is like a machine, okay? Think of your body as a machine. You have to put the proper fuels in it to get it to work properly. If you don't put the proper fuels, it ain't gonna work. And if you put fuels that aren't as good quality as others, that will lead to heart disease, cancers, strokes, diabetes, obesity, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. It's like if you take a Porsche and you fill it up with diesel, what happens? You just, you just screwed your car up, right? And I guarantee, what are people going to say to you when you say, hey man, I, I, um, I put diesel in my car today. You know what they're going to say to you? I guarantee they're going to say, what the fuck is wrong with you? No, no offense. When somebody puts a hamburger in their mouth, nobody's saying, what the fuck is wrong with you? Stop. Stop. All right? You get everything. All right? I know I said think of your body as a machine. Now think of your body as a house. I love, I love analogies. Um, think of your body as a house, right? To build a house, you've got to start with a foundation. You can't start with the roof. Here's the foundation. This is the foundation. This is where all of it starts. The fruits and vegetables. Keto, a uh, healthy diet, variety of foods, a variety of colors. You get everything from this, right? And then you build your walls with the legumes, the beans. And you've got the whole grains, the wheat, the pasta, the spaghetti, the rice, the breads. And on top, your roof. You've got your nuts and seeds. You can get everything from this, everything. All your vitamins, A, B, C, vitamin D from the sun. You get all your calcium, all your iron, your omega-3, all your protein, the amino acids. Everything from this, everything. Now, I know I'm a skinny white dude with glasses telling you get enough protein, but these guys aren't skinny. Only one of them's white. So, as you can see, these guys, their diet consists of no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no fish. Um, there might be some variations, like you know, Tony Gonzalez, he might be eating fish. You know, I don't, don't hold me to it, but I know Prince Fielder, who is your 2009 home run king, home run derby king, no meat, no dairy yet, no eggs, no fish. Mac Danzing, who fights in the Ultimate Fighter, uh, he's season one champion, UFC fighter, no meat, no dairy, no eggs, no fish. So you can still excel at you know, your sports. You can still gain muscle mass um, on a plant-based diet. Again, just remember the gorilla. So what do they eat? Instead of dairy, you know, everything, everything you know, a meat eater, a dairy eater, uh, an egg eater eats, I eat as well, it just comes in plant form. No cruelty involved, no, high, you know, no cholesterol, high in fiber. Um, and these are all the processed food. This is the transition food. This is where you go when you go from eating meat, you know, and you make that switch. Um, instead of poultry, instead of beef, garden burger, um, veggie burger. Um, Right here, what you see up here, this is one of the best items on the market. And again, not like the healthiest food in the world, um, but certainly better than um, your meat. This is called the riblets. Now, you know, I want you to try. If you haven't tried this, go to Publix Whole Foods. You can get all this food at Publix and Whole Foods. Um, and it's really amazing. If you, if you try it out on you know, your family, you don't tell them it's meat. You know, I'd love to see the, the response they give. It really is good stuff. And remember, all meat, dairy, and egg products go through a process. All right? um, it doesn't just magically form. In this case, the process involves killing, cooking, pasteurization, refrigeration, freezing, and we cannot forget the all-important seasoning. I mean, I remember going to McDonald's as a child and I didn't just get a, a slab of meat. You know, that slab of meat had herbs and spices put into it, was put on a grill, cooked, and then it came to me with a bun, lettuce, tomatoes, ketchup, mustard, and onions, and a pickle. What are all those things made out of? Plants. We put condiments, spices, and herbs on the meat to make it taste better. In fact, what would meat be without plants? Just be a dead animal. Be a carcass on your plate. It would be no different from roadkill. <laughs> so the word of the day is vegan. And a vegan is somebody who chooses not to eat any meat, dairy, eggs, or fish. And again, how is this extreme? How is it extreme not to be drinking the milk of any other species? How is it extreme not to be eating hen periods? How is it extreme <laughs> to not be participating in a system that unnecessarily kills animals? A lot of kids say, man, they, even after all this, they're still like, what do I eat as a vegan? Now, all these products are vegan. There's no meat, no dairy, no eggs. But this is all crap. This is unhealthy. This is the junk food vegan. And, I, and you know, kids get all excited. All right, I'm going vegan. I eat just nothing but... <laughs> it's like, God only knows what to tell the parents. Um, you know, if your diet consists of nothing but Oreos, Skittles, Airheads, Fritos, Sour Patch Kids, and Big League Chew, you're going to die. This is unhealthy. I don't know if kids hear that, but you know, all right, I'm going to live. Um, on a healthier note, you know, you have your scrambled eggs, I have my scrambled tofu. Pancakes, you don't have to use um, cow milk, you use soy milk, oat milk, rice milk, almond milk, coconut milk, hemp milk, fruits and vegetables, spaghetti, pasta. 
refried beans. You even have vegan sour cream, guacamole, comes from the avocado. Uh, soy cheese, rice cheese, they even you know, have this magical cheese I'll get to in a sec. Veggie burger, veggie dog. Cupcakes, you, they have egg replacers. I think I'm gonna have them up here. So you can replace the eggs with bananas, applesauce even. You can use soy milk, oat milk, um, more flour, water. Coconut milk ice cream, one of the best ice creams in the world. Again, not healthy, but you know, healthier than cow milk ice cream. Um, you know, I've always said to people, hey man, if you can put a man or a woman on the moon, how hard is it to make a cheese that doesn't come from a cow or you know, a goat? Like how is it hard is it to make a vegan cheese? Well, they heard me. Um, this is called a uh, Daya cheese actually. And it, the great thing is no soy, um, no rice. It's actually made out of uh, tapioca and arrowroot flour. I know that's not making your mouth water, but man, it is good. Um, here's an, another example of where you can get your protein from. This is a vegan sausage. It's about that big. It's the size of this remote. And there's four in a package. Each one of these has 29 grams of protein. Um, and again, the healthiest food you can eat is the whole foods. I don't mean the supermarket. I mean the fruits, the vegetables, the rice, the beans. You know, stuff that's fresh. It's not processed. Um, the last thing I do want to show you is um, another video. This is a happier video. And this is the whole idea of change in perception. I know I'm keeping you here, Jesus, longer than uh, you probably wanted. But um, this is a really beautiful story. And I hope you enjoy it. for slaughter and that would have been her fate but she wanted to live and so she literally ran for her life and now she'll live out her life in sanctuary. It's interesting how the public responds when one individual animal you know makes a run for her life they end up making headlines on national news people's hearts go out to this one individual animal the cruelty that, that happens to farm animals is largely hidden you know behind factory farm walls and people aren't aware of it. When you look in her eyes, you know, everyone wants the best for her once they get to know her. And when people are able to identify with an individual and look her in the eye and see that she's a living, feeling being who has a will to live, then people care. I've been working here with Animal Care and Control for almost nine years. This morning was really astonishing to me. All of a sudden, it's dawned on me, this sweet, innocent cow running away from being slaughtered. And I never even thought about it before, that something is actually being slaughtered and it's my ground beef and it's my dog on steak and stuff like that and we've been eating this for years. I never pictured that face on that and it hurt. I can't do that. I can't. So now we are gonna work on not eating me, me and my entire family. Because <laughs> I'm realizing that this is a life that's safe today. And with my family, we'll be saving a couple more. Thank you. Yep. She looks like she's about a year old. Um, absolutely beautiful Hereford. And those, unfortunately, are cows that they use for meat. Um, she's most likely at a live market. And because they have a very strong will to live, like any living creature, she got loose. She had a will to live, and she did it. Hello. And where she's going now, she's going to have like cows of her own breed even. She's going to be so happy. When the trailer arrives, yes. the cows in the herd will move. Yeah, they, they move will move in a big line. Everybody lines up. They will start like moving to her <laughs> to comfort her and to tell her that they're there. And she will move back. Any animal, any creature has a strong will to live. She's an ambassador for all animals who are still suffering in slaughterhouses and on farms and who don't don't have such a such a lucky outcome. People love a happy ending and it's it's, it's happy.
I've seen that like a hundred times and I still get goosebumps. Um, it's simple, you know, it's unnecessary, it doesn't have to be this way. Um, you change your perception, you change the story. That's all it is, it's just the changing of the story and you know, we can't wait for other people to do it, we have to do it ourselves. Um, every animal wants to live, every animal wants to live and no animal wants to experience pain. Um, if you guys want more information, you can always email me at james at arf.org. You can visit our website for all of this information, arff.org. Um, we're giving these presentations throughout the year. Um, this is obviously every last Sunday of the month. I give these presentations here at Sublime, 530, 630. Uh, I know we've gone over. Um, but also, um, we go to juvenile detention centers. We go to high schools. We do other many different presentations on different subjects as well. Right now, I'm spending most of my time in camps. It's been very nice not to have to say, if you can hear my voice clap once, um, <laughs> don't put that in your mouth or your ear. Um, so yeah, if you want more information about what we do, all these presentations are free. They're all free. We give them free. So if you're interested in having a presentation at your, your school, if you're a teacher, uh, at some community event that you might be running, um, we do everything. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. You know, uh, birthday party, uh, bar mitzvah, bar mitzvah, <laughs> circumcision, maybe not the circumcision. All right. Um, also, I, I do want to say um, there is, um, there's a lot of information out there. We have starter kits. We have um, uh, why vegans to talk about the ethical aspect of, of veganism. Um, there's also, again, more information on the Animal Rights Foundation. This is a card. This has a list of all the veg-friendly restaurants in South Florida, Miami-Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach counties. Definitely take one of these. It's all out there on the table. This is my card as well. If you have any questions, you can come see me. If you did not print out the um, email, if you were on the Sublime list and you want $10 off tonight, it's only for the table. Um, so, yeah, I apologize for that, but it's for the table. So um, not everybody at the table gets it. It's just, or maybe, no, you know what? I'm, I'm wrong. I'm totally wrong. It's for two. So it's, it's, uh, if you have a group of four people, you get two of these. Um, and thank you guys for listening. I hope you enjoyed it.